its purpose is to educate and mobilize the people of Santa Cruz County to protect their homes, their communities, and the environment from wildfire. And there was just a recent grand jury report um, released, and I was surprised to find that Santa Cruz County has the largest percentage of res residents living in the wildland urban interface of any county in the state. That's 72,000 homes that are in this high risk area. So this is important information for all of us who live in that zone to know about. Uh, this section right here talks about the three main ways that homes can catch fire when there's a wildfire. The single largest most one is the first one in the upper left hand corner. It's from Embers and Firebrands. About 75% of all homes that burn, this is the way they catch fire. It's not a fire front coming through. It's embers that are uh, being blown up to a mile, even two miles ahead of the main fire. They're starting spot fires. There's no firemen there and the house is burned. The photo is actually taken in a large uh, uh, facility in Charlotte, North Carolina that is built exclusively to test different materials and how they resist uh, flames and fires, what burns, what doesn't. They build entire houses in here and burn them down. The second uh, way a house catches fire is flame contact. That means something uh, adjacent to or on your house catches fire and starts your house on fire. And the third is radiant heat. And houses burn incredibly hot once they get going. And just the heat radiating off those is enough to set other houses on fire. This is more of a concern in residential areas where the homes are fairly close together than in more country settings where the homes are further apart. And by the end of this presentation, we should be able to tell why this house burned. At first glance, you can see there's a lot of uh, cleared space around the house. The grass is still green around it. There's uh, plenty of open space, yet this house burned almost to the ground. And hopefully we'll know, know why by the time we're done with this. You may have seen this chart before. There's several variations on it. This is the most recent version. And when you're working on defending your house, what you want to do is start in what is now called the zero zone. And that actually is the envelope of your house and the five feet immediately around it. If an ember storm comes in and catches something on fire in that five foot zone, it catches your house on fire. Then the section after that, is the zero, the five to 30 foot zone. And you can have plantings and vegetation in this area, but um, you want them fairly spaced, far apart, etc. Zone two is going out uh, beyond that to 100 feet if your property's that big. And then another really critical one is zone three, which is the area where your car gets in and out of your house and where fire vehicles are trying to get in to access your home. So those are all important zones. You kind of work on them simultaneously, but the most important zone to start working on immediately is the zone zero. And when you're working in the zone zero, your number one priority should be your roof. It's the largest surface on your house. It would get a lot of exposure to embers blowing in and uh, it can have vulnerabilities that you would want to address pretty quickly. One is you want your roof to be in good shape if you've got curling shingles or things like that. Those are places that embers can slip in under, uh, under and, and catch your, um, the sheathing under your uh, roofing on fire. Also, any place where you have complex roof angles, like dormer windows or where a chimney comes out of your roof, any place where embers, excuse me, um, 
debris, leaves, twigs can accumulate because if embers are raining down on the roof, they're gonna catch those twi twigs and leaves on fire. Uh, another, if you have skylights in your home, skylights are also a vulnerability. And those are more subject to the radiant heat. If it gets really hot near your house, it can crack those and allow fire into your house. So number one priority was your roof. Number two are your vents. And every house needs vents to allow moisture to wick up out of your house. Your house can accumulate moisture and you need to have a way to get it out. But that also is a place where embers can get into your house. Typical places you'll find your roof vents are right at the top of the ridge of your roof, under the eaves of your roof, down at your foundation, and then if you have a gable end, you may have uh, vents up there too. So those are uh, your second priority to look at as far as hardening your home and making it safer from wildfire. So this is just showing a little bit more about um, points of entry on the roof. Uh, if you have, you could have a class A roof, which is the highest fire rated roof you can have. But if you have wooden framing, coming out of that roof and you get leaves or debris, debris accumulating there, it can set that wood framing on fire. Another big vulnerability are gutters. And some people are actually removing gutters from their homes. The middle picture on the upper, in the upper section is in that test laboratory and they were testing plastic or vinyl gutters and metal gutters. To the back of the house is a metal gutter, and you can see that if there are leaves or other things that accumulate in there, they can wick in under your roof and catch uh, the under part of your roof on fire. The plastic or the vinyl gutters will tend to melt and fall off, but that's why the five foot zone immediately around yourself you want to keep clear because if that lands into vegetation that's right up against your house, that's another way to catch your house on fire. Third vulnerability is if you have uh, flammable structure uh, appendages attached to your house. The picture in the upper right, there was a fence that caught on fire and it went right over to the garage and is now setting the garage on fire. And then uh, the lower picture shows embers coming in through a gable vent or the vents that are under the eaves of your house. This is in that test laboratory. They were photographing them coming in. So all points you need to be paying attention to. And uh, if you're like me, you use your attic for storage. Uh, my attic used to look like this. I now have everything in heavy duty plastic boxes that are sealed and away from the, uh, the vents. The embers that come through are pretty small. And so if there's a loose piece of paper, they can catch the paper on fire, but they're not likely to catch something bigger on fire. The old standard, and if you have an older home, you may have uh, your vents with wire mesh that's a, a quarter inch in size. You would want to replace those. Replacing vents is not that expensive, and it has a lot of value. To replace a vent is maybe about $30. What they're now recommending is that you replace the quarter inch vents with eight inch vents. Even if little embers do get through, they're usually so small, they wouldn't create a problem if you have eighth inch mesh. So if you have vents, check them. If they're quarter inch or larger, you may want to think about replacing them. This is showing other vents. And I'll just mention, it's a complicated guide, but California has a section of their building code called Chapter 7A. And in that section, they have things that are uh, products that go into homes that are related to fire that they've done testing on and they have met uh, fire approval standards. So if you were looking for fencing or decking or skylights, 
Chapter 7a has it. It's kind of hard to read. It's more for contractors, but it is a source to find uh, reliable information on fire safe products. Uh, the vent in, in picture A uh, is a new style of vent. It's called it, it's a vent, the eighth inch screening with intumescent honeycomb mesh. And behind it is a mesh. And what happens is if heat gets close to this, the honeycomb melts and seals the vent holes. It's very good for keeping embers out, but after a fire, you would have to replace them. These just show some other style vents. Uh, baffles make it hard for flames to uh, embers to maneuver and get inside. Some use uh, stainless steel wool as part of it to keep embers out. So there's different kinds depending on what your preferences are. This is a picture of one of those melted, melted into mesome screens. You see the heat got to it and it ended up sealing the vent so no embers could get in. Another spot, you know, we, whenever there's a red flag warning, we make it a point to go up on our roof and blow it off. It, this doesn't look like a lot of leaf litter. This is right where the under the ridge uh, roof fence are. But just imagine embers landing in this and being able to wick in under, under the, into that roof vent. So trying to keep your roof clean is a very high priority. And it's just something we, our roof is shallow enough, we can go up and blow it off whenever uh, it's a red flag warning. So that then we don't have to worry about. Many people here have skylights, especially if you live in the forest. And if you get the, these kind of roof accumulations would be very dangerous in a fire. Um, the the uh, skylight on the left is tempered glass. It may be double pane. It, uh, it, it is better for uh, resisting cracking during heat, but if you have uh, debris right on top of it and it burns, it could crack, allowing fire to enter your home. The plastic dome-shaped uh, skylights are good in that they shed uh, the leaf litter off the top, but they also will melt at lower temperature and are more subject we had some of these on our house and as part of our 12 year plan this is not something you can do in a year but in year 11 of our home hardening project we replaced our domed ones with tempered glass ones that's a more expensive proposition but if you're keeping your roof clean you would have less um, a little less danger from that another inexpensive but very important uh, thing you want to have, and it's an older home you might want to check, is a gutter flashing. And what that is, it's a piece of metal strip that inserts under your roof and goes down into your gutter. And if any debris in your gutter catches on fire, it helps prevent the uh, flames from wicking in under your roofing. Um, another thing that people do are putting up gutter guards. Do not get plastic or vinyl ones. If you get gutter guards, get metal ones. If you get debris on top of those, you would still want to clean it off, but it does make uh, the cleaning process a lot faster and easier to do. This uh, shows the importance of uh, keeping your gutters clean. This was up in the car fire. These guys had a metal roof, which is really good for fire, but they had, the, the thought, the theory is that they had debris in their gutters and it wicked in under the uh, metal roofing and caught their house on fire. And this house was considered a, a loss because of that. So simple thing to, oops. Simple thing to do, but really important to keep your gutters clean. Uh, now we're moving down off the roof of the house. And most of us here in California have grown up what I call the Sunset Magazine landscaping uh, pro process. 
And that is where you anchor your home to the, the, the landscape with vegetation. And anytime you have vegetation right up immediately next to your home, if you imagine hot, hot weather, dry embers blowing into this, this is gonna catch your house on fire. So we're having to learn a new aesthetic about making uh, the five feet immediately around your house free of anything that might catch on fire. Just a case in point, uh, this, this house uh, was up in paradise. The house survived, but you can see the grass is still green, but they had uh, large scale embers coming in. You can see them in the person's hand. We actually had embers coming down in our house in Bonnie Dune that were three and four inches large, big, just drifting down on, and landing on our, our property. And you can see in the picture that all the vegetation right up next to the house burned. Uh, you can't see it in this picture, but the windows are actually cracked in this from the heat of that, uh, of the vegetation burning. Fortunately, it was a new home. They had double pane windows and stucco exterior. So their house uh, survived, but it did actually crack the windows. This is just a, another view of a house. There's just a little potted plant there in the corner. And just that little pot, potted plant burned hot enough that you can see that it cracked the window there. Again, double pane, so it didn't burn through. But you just, you just really, if you wanna save your home, you just, it's very dangerous to have things that close to your house. People ask about, well, are there fire safe plants? And pretty much everything will burn if it gets hot enough. Um, if you do want to keep landscaping up closer to your house, keep it low, keep it farther apart so it burns with less intensity. Um, plants that are, uh, if you rub them and they have a smell, they usually are um, resinous and are more likely to burn. Um, also, things like rosemary look beautiful on the outside, but the interior of them is uh, full of hard, dry tw twigs. And with their high uh, uh, resin count, those are uh, actually pretty dangerous plants to have close to your home. Here's uh, showing a home. It is a shingle house, which is you know vulnerable, but they have done a really good job creating a, a fuel break around their house. Um, you can see even in the bush, the bush back by their garage has been limbed up so that uh, embers are less likely to catch it on fire. And they've done some hardscaping uh, immediately around their house. And just to let people know, it does not just to be, have to be bare packed dirt. If you want to have a walkway, you can make it attractive. You know, you can do all kinds of things to make a place look attractive, but just you just want to keep the vegetation away from your house. And uh, this is actually a picture of my house. And in the top left picture, you can see pre-education, I had three foot wide, five foot tall pyracantha columns under my four foot, eight foot eave, I had roses and packed with uh, flowering plants right around my house. The picture below shows my re-landscaping. I did put in a water feature. I put in some California gold gravel lined with bricks. And I put in a low growing candy tuft, which is drought tolerant, stays evergreen, has pretty flowers in the spring and grows very low. So technically it shouldn't be up to my house, but my house is stucco, so I was willing to uh, take a chance. And instead of the columns of uh, pyracantha, I put metal wall sculptures up. So you can be creative and do things to make your um, home still look attractive, but be more fire safe. Um, as we move down the side of the house, one other thing you want to consider is um, 
It's a metal drip edge, which usually occurs at the base of an exterior wall. It's sort of like that gutter guard. Some homes, you just have the plywood and the sheathing on the outside. And if fire gets under there and something starts burning, it can wick up into the siding of your house. It's just a very simple little metal strip and it does actually provide a lot of protection to your home. One other thing, um, we just had a Diablo wind event and if after it had ended, you walked around your house and looked at places where leaves accumulated, that is most likely where you're going to find embers accumulating too. So, uh, and so that just shows a picture of leaves accumulating. That would be an area these people would want to pay particular interest to, maybe put some sort of metal plate at the bottom of their wooden door or something like that. Um, the picture on the right shows that area where the wood siding ends, and that's where that little, um, that little plate, that little uh, flashing would go between the concrete and the lower side of your um, uh, exterior, whatever exterior you have. And one thing they have learned, and this is uh, something firemen call vertical kindling, are wooden lath fences. They tend to be pretty dried out. They catch fire very easily. And if you have lath around your house, that might be something around your deck or under a deck or other places, it might be something you want to consider replacing. And again, the picture on the uh, left, high kind of weedy grass area would carry flame very quickly up to that fence. That fence is attached to the wooden building. And before you know it, you would have fire in that, on that building. Oops. Uh, and this is just another photo showing that example of, of siding, of fencing catching fire and extending it to the house. One thing you can do, you can have metal fencing, especially if it's more than five feet away from your home. But if you can break it up by putting in a metal gate, or even if you're evacuating and you can prop your gate open, to break the uh, fire chain going from the fencing to your house. Just the five feet around your house, you wanna look at everything and work on making that, um, at making that uh, very clear of anything that might catch fire. So picture in the upper left, firefighters coming to defend this house would have, know that they would have a really a challenge trying to defend this house. They couldn't toss that wood out fast enough to get, uh, to save it. The, uh, so it's sort of like a given, if, if you wanna save your house and you live in the fire country, don't store anything underneath your, your decks. The fellow on the uh, right has done a good job. He's put in some uh, hard, hardscaping, See. have some hardscaping there. He's put got concrete around his pillars. But one thing you would want to think is if there were a red flag warning, you would probably want to go and blow under this house in case there had been an accumulation of leaves or other things in one of those corners. As you move away from the five foot zone around the house, what you want to do is if there is fire approaching your house, you want it to stay on the ground. You do not want it rising up. As it rises up, you know the fire is of higher intensity. There's more potential for wind to whip it around. So limbing up trees close to your house, separating them. If you have plantings, having them far apart. The idea is, is if fire, a firewall does approach your house, it's low and on the ground and burning with lower intensity. And if you've done good home hardening, it's very likely that your house can be saved even with a fire front approaching it. So 
we're going to do a little quiz right now. And um, I could, let's see, I think we, maybe what I'll do is uh, let you look at this for 10 seconds. And then if uh, maybe one of you uh, would like to tell some things that you might do to make this house safer, we'll see if, uh, see if we can do that. We don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, take a minute, look and see, see if you can see three or four things this homeowner might want to do to make their home safer. Everybody should have the ability to unmute themselves. So if you want to unmute yourself and chime in, feel free. Um, I see there's a lot of uh, a lot of plants near the house, a lot of bushes. Yep, and, and the tree is pretty close to the deck. Looks like also. Right. Good. Uh, it looks to me like the plants on the uh, left are rosemary which is a volatile, it, it's a volatile few. I would probably either separate those and keep them very small or remove them entirely. Those, uh, those can burn very hot. Anybody else see anything here that uh, these homeowners might wanna consider? There's that laugh on the, on the deck on the right that you were talking about being very flammable. Yep, that, that would wick fire right up into the house. So I would actually probably make that my number one priority. Um, other things you might do if, uh, you, if your home were under threat and you were going to evacuate is drag all the patio furniture, especially if it's wood inside the house or toss it down the hillside. Um, it looks like they have some sort of blanket hanging off the upper deck that could easily catch fire. Um, behind the house, they have fairly dense uh, forest. Um, one comment is uh, pre-colonial colonization times in, in California, the people who lived here, the Ama Mutsen, they burned over the land about every seven years. And what ended up happening, they managed this land for between seven and 10,000 years. And studies show that back then, the tree density was about 10 trees per acre. And now tree density is running about 80 to 100 trees per acre. So um, lots of uh, dead fuel is falling to the ground. It's not burning off. Uh, trees are close together, which is as in drought conditions, you have more trees on the same piece of land, all competing for scarce water. Um, limbing them up uh, can help. Also disease can spread a lot faster and infestations of bark beetles can move with the trees closer together. So at the minimum, maybe limbing up some of those trees and maybe taking a few of them out will mean that, mean that the trees that remain are actually uh, more healthy. Okay, here's a quiz number two. Um, I'll give you a second and if anybody would like to pop in and see what they observe, that would be great. Well, the tree branches are touching the roof. That's a big no-no, right? And there's a bush right in front of the window. Yeah, right. and wouldn't it be easy for the fire to jump from the bush up to the tree branches and then go up as well? That is, yeah, and that's actually called laddering, where you have uh, low plants down low and they have a bridge that can take them to jump up into a tree. So uh, if, if you were to keep this tree here, which is only going to get much, much bigger, if, but if you wanted to keep it, I would probably limb this tree 20 feet up. There's also a wooden deck back there, which would catch it on fire. Good point, Allison. The, the one other hint I'm seeing is if you look at that gutter that's closest to us, you can see the wet patch on the wall behind it. That indicates to me that their gutters are clogged. And if their gutters are clogged and embers get in there, it's putting a fire right up next to where it can wick in under the roof. That's really well spotted there. Also, there's no gutter guards. Yeah, I can't really see if they're gutter guards or not, but I'm going to guess they're not. Right. That's why they're clogged. Yep. Okay. 
Okay, well, let's, uh, let's take a look at this house. And um, anybody have any thoughts about what this homeowner should do? And this actually looks like quite a few homes we might find up, older homes in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Yeah, this is very typical. Well, there's a lot of dry brush right by the deck. And then those pine trees so, are going to go up like a Roman candle, right? Mm -hmm. They're full of sap. So you, yeah, you might, um, that tree that's closest, you, if you didn't, couldn't bear to take it out, I would limb it way up and maybe limb some of the branches further away from the house. I mean, ideally, you'd probably want 30 feet from the house, but um, I'd limb up all those trees, um, separate the fuels. Because it's an older home, I would also suspect that it's got quarter inch vents in it. So you might want to check the vents and see. Um, also, some windows have plastic screens on them or vinyl screens rather than metal screens. Those can also catch fire and put um, heat right up next to your windows. So this one a fireman looking at would realize this was going to be a tough house to save in its current current situation. Okay, what would you guys say about this house? This house is perfect. Mm, it looks no. like it's any other yeah, it's hard to tell because it's kind of distance, but it looks like there are, are, are those bushes that are right up against the house? You got it. Yep, they've done an excellent job in the 30 to 100 foot zone. Their grass is all mowed down to within three inches. They've limbed the trees up very well. There's good separation between the trees. Even if they did catch fire, it would probably be low intensity. And oak trees are um, fire, uh, they, fire adapted, so these trees would probably survive. But do you remember that picture I showed you right at the beginning about why the house that burned? They had vegetation right up against the house. So the embers rained in there, caught that vegetation on, uh, up, uh, on fire around the house, and they lost the house, even though they had really um, well done defensible space in their 30 to 100, 100 foot zone. So that five foot zone, including your house and the five feet immediately around it, is probably your most important area that you want to think about. Okay, uh, just real quick, anybody have any thoughts on this home? There's a bunch of firewood stacked right by the deck. Yep, and, and the rule is you want to have firewood at least 30 feet from your home. I had friends who had four cords of firewood uh, away from their home, and when they came home, it was an inch of dust, uh, an inch of ash. So yeah, the, it all burns, and that'll burn hot, and that'll burn a long time. And the longer it burns close up to something, um, the more chance it has of catching on fire. Um, the, there's also looks, something, go ahead. Uh, it looks like there's some kind of drainage hose coming off the roof. Is that metal or is that a uh, plastic drainage hose? Don't know. Don't know, but they do. Are you talking at the on the far side of the house on the right? Or under the deck? Uh, the house, part of the house on the right, it kind of comes down off of the higher story and then it loops around one of the uh, vents coming up. Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure what that is. But uh, I will tell you that the people who submitted this phone, uh, this photo, they moved their wood pile, they cleaned and raked under their deck, um, they mowed all this area. And during the CZU fire, their neighbors on both sides lost their home. They have, they're on a sleep, steep hill looking down into the San Lorenzo Valley. And the fire burned right up to their deck, but their house was saved. So even though it's a wooden um, board and batten house it, and wooden decking, with a little bit of work, they were able to save their home.
Okay, this is, I think, our last quiz question, folks. That uh, that looks tough, that one. It looks hard to defend. It looks like it's a, in like a little bowl or a lot of embers would probably drop on it. Yeah, and fire also, this is called a fire chimney, this little ravine. Fire has a tendency to move, accelerate and move really quickly up hills. And that thing is just packed full of, uh, packed full of fuel. So that's probably your number one thing. I can see a couple other things these people might want to be aware of. Well, I mean, it looks like the bushes are going right up to the edge of the house. <laughs> right. The side on the right is a little better. They have some separation from the plants, between the plants, which is good. But they do have, even on that side, some vegetation right up against the house. But on the other side, yeah, they would, they would need to do quite a bit of clearing there. One other comment I would make is this has a complex roof line with some skylights and various angles. So this would also be a roof you probably you could get up on and blow off any embers because if they're blowing up that chimney, uh, that vegetation chimney, they're going to be blowing ashes, uh, 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 embers up on the roof too. Okay. And this is just a little diagram showing that the steeper the slope, the more separation you want on vegetation. Flat ground travel, fire travels more slowly, but it does roar up uh, hillsides. So those areas you're going to want to keep vegetation low and further apart. Uh, this, when we first started talking, we talked about um, fire spreading by radiant heat. And that's actually what happened in this neighborhood. The, um, the homes were close enough together and once one caught fire, the next one caught fire. So in this kind of situation, you know, neighbors would want to work together about the type of fencing they have around their house, what kind of vegetation is growing. This would be a neighborhood that would probably want to have a shaded fuel break around, um, around their um, community if possible to slow and decrease the intensity of fire as it moves closer to their neighborhood. But um, this was up in Santa Rosa and whole neighborhoods went up. So this is a tougher situation and you really just don't want fire to get started at all in these neighborhoods if you can help it. So the zero to five foot zone and pretty much everything else you need to pay attention to. And I'm just showing a few pictures. Um, 900 people lost their homes here in Santa Cruz County with the most recent fire. A lot of them will be build, rebuilding, um, especially in Australia, which is about 10 years ahead of us in terms of intense wildfire. They've been doing a lot of work on um, designing homes that are actually capable of saving themselves. So you can see that their overhangs are all metal. They have some plants close to the house, but the siding is uh, pretty fireproof. So this is the kind of um, things people are looking at in the future if they want to build in the wildland urban interface. You can see all the vegetation growing up near the house is low growing and separated. These just show some other homes um, that can look attractive and um, have plantings around them, but still be very defensible. Firemen seeing these homes would think they have a good shot at defending and saving these homes. So um, just showing you kind of some examples of putting walkways around the one in the lower uh, lower left. They have a little hedge, but it's low and it's out of the five foot zone. You know, they, so just giving you some ideas about the kind of things, if people are rebuilding or thinking about redoing things, just to give you some ideas. Um, 
Other things, uh, in Australia, people are putting in metal decking, metal undersides to their decking on their houses, metal awnings. Uh, in Australia, many homes ha now have uh, retractable metal window coverings that they can roll down to protect the house from heat. And also soffits under the eaves. Here in California, a lot of the eaves are open but having them closed like this is good uh, protection from fires. And then the uh, house on the bottom right shows kind of a mixture of stone, low growing grasses, river rock, um, using stone as um, kind of sculptural elements and some plants. Just giving you an idea of so how some people are treating landscaping in other parts of the world. Uh, this was a home that was designed uh, for after the Paradise Fire. And if you look, you can see all the windows have and doors have sliding panels that can be slid over them. They have hardscaping in the five feet immediately surrounding the house. The uh, roof supports are metal and um, and this is cinder block, but it could certainly be stuccoed or covered over. But this just gives you some ideas about um, things people are thinking about if they're rebuilding their homes to make sure they can survive wildfires. And up to now, we've been talking about things we as individuals can do to, um, to make our homes safer. But really, fire does not stop at property lines. And there's a program out there that is really catching on. It's been around about 20 years, but it's accelerating a lot right now. It's called Firewise USA. And basically, it's a grassroots program. Firewise provides you with a template that tells you how to organize your neighborhood and do work to make sure your roads are clear, you have elderly people or disabled people who might need a little help, you do work parties, you do an educational event, something like what I'm presenting to you today. Um, and, it, um, and what happens is when you have done the initial work after the first year, you can get a Firewise community signage. And that is assigned to firefighters everywhere because for example, right at our house here in Bonnie Dune, we had fire defenders from Butte County, uh, San Luis Obispo, and Los Angeles. They don't know our area, but if they come into an area and see that it's a firewise community, they know that neighborhood has done the work to make their neighborhood safer, and they're going to feel better about going in and trying to defend it. Just briefly, uh, there's six steps to becoming a Firewise community. You fo form a committee comprised of residents. Um, you'll work with your local fire department to do a walkthrough, to do a risk assessment of your neighborhood. Now, one caveat here is that right now, fire, de fire departments are not able to do these risk assessments. They're out fighting fires. They are, they're really not staffed to do this, but if you can't find uh, your local fire, fire department to do it, the Fire Safe Council, we're all volunteer, we have jobs, but we will try and help you get that local uh, wildfire risk assessment done. You're required to host one educational outreach event, just like this one I'm doing today. Um, you put together a multi-year plan. Again, this is not something you'll do in one year, but you can say make a three-year plan, a five-year plan. And with your risk assessment, you tackle the low-hanging fruit first and then keep plugging away at it. And then each neighborhood is, each neighbor in the neighborhood is required to either put in one hour of volunteer time or $26. It's a pretty low hurdle. And then uh, once you've done the work, you cre create and submit your application. And uh, if you receive the certification, you get the signage, which may help uh, insurers feel more comfortable about your neighborhood. No guarantees, but if neighborhoods are doing the work, 
it lowers the risk for them to insure your neighborhood and may be an argument you, you can use in your favor. Um, and this is just an example of neighbors helping neighbors and doing a, a work party. Not everybody has to do the physical work. Somebody, some people could bring potluck food, some could do the mailing list, other activities. Just want to get everyone involved. And not only does this have benefit for fires, but if there are earthquakes or debris flows or other kinds of natural disasters or other things happening, you know your neighbors, you can help each other, and it helps build a real great sense of community. The other part of doing the FireWise program is to make sure your roads are capable of supporting firefighters. If they feel unsafe taking their very expensive equipment in and that they're going to get trapped with it in your, on your, in your neighborhood, they may, not, they may not come in and defend. So part of your FireWise uh, risk assessment is looking at your roads, making sure the houses have Street, num street numbers on them, that the signs telling how to get in and out are all good, all those kinds of things. And also many kids are feeling a lot of stress and anxiety about fire and giving them an action they can do is empowering. It helps uh, bring the neighborhood together. And uh, you know, there's a task for everyone in a FireWise community. This document here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but I highly recommend you go to the Fire Safe Council of Santa Cruz County website and you can download this. It's a three page document. And just briefly, if you have to evacuate and you fill out the section on the right, it tells when you evacuated, where you went, etc. Sometimes fire. Uh, teams stay in a neighborhood for four or five days, making sure there are no spot fires. And if you have a koi pond or something and they know how to get a hold of you, it's possible they'll call and say, where's the fish food? Or do you have an extra hose? Or any of those kind of things. So filling this out and taping it to your door or window as you leave is a good idea. Um, this is things you can do to prepare on the far Right, it, these are things you can do today to start getting yourself ready to uh, be better prepared for fire. Um, we have listed all the items on all these pages in ascending order of priority. So on the left-hand column, you might only get through the top five things, but those are probably the five most important things. Um, we've talked about Today's talk was about protecting your home, home hardening, and we've also talked about protecting your property. The one thing I will draw your attention to is at the bottom of this page, optional personal protective clothing. Um, don't evacuate in flip-flops. If you have time, put on boots. Uh, during the windstorm we just had, uh, big Doug Fur came down. We were out at 1.30 in the morning with chainsaws, cutting it off. We had our hard hats on with our headlamps, and uh, stuff was raining down on us. So good thing to have. Uh, wear, have a pair of leather gloves. If a flame, flaming branch drops in the road in front of you as you're trying to evacuate, you don't want to try and pull that off with your bare hands. Don't wear a nylon clothing. If embers get on it, uh, they can melt it to your skin. So there are just some little tips here about the type of clothing you want to wear if you're evacuating. And this is probably the most important page. And I'd actually suggest printing this out twice and putting one of these, one copy in your car. Um, the, uh, if there's a fire somewhere nearby, but you haven't been given evacuation order, the column on the left is for you. It's, uh, you, for example, park your vehicles in the driveway facing out, put your keys in your pocket, uh, put your purse, wallet, maps on the car seat, Close the car windows and doors because if embers get in there, they could start things on fire in your car. 
this is a checklist and believe me if you haven't evacuated it's hard to think clearly and this just gives you step by step things to do when the evacuation order comes there's steps that you can do specifically in the middle column and the column on the right talks about what happens if you're trapped in your vehicle if you're trapped on foot or if you're trapped at home and have to shelter in place so a lot of good information here um, i highly recommend you print it out from the uh, firesafe uh, santa cruz county website one other uh, thing i'd like to recommend is this book i think it's about 14 bucks on amazon this woman lost her home to a fire in Colorado. She's a journalist and she wrote a great book and her uh, section on insurance uh, before a fire, what to look at, make sure you've got is excellent. Uh, most people are over 25% underinsured. Right now, the well, prior to the fire, they were recommending that homes be insured at $400 per square foot. But now that 900 people are going to have to be re rebuilding their homes, that may not be enough. So she gives you all kinds of great tips there. And also, if you are unfortunate enough to learn, lose your home to a fire, she has great information on negotiating with your insurance com com uh, company and other things like that. So in summary, if you were a firefighter, in a triage situation where there was more fire and more homes than you had firemen, which of these homes would you try to save? Where would you be safer? So I'd just like to close by saying that um, fire has a place in our ecology. It's going to happen no matter what, and there are ways we can live better with it. And creating defensible space and hardening our homes also helps protect our neighbors and the environment. So do the work in advance of a wildfire to prepare your home property and your neighborhood. Um, it's a, just as important as the firefighters, the work the firefighters are going to do to save your homes. Um, but so there's some things we can all do to make our homes and environment safer. And lastly, these are just some links to some of the things we talked about here if you wanna do uh, a little further research on this. And I'm sorry, I, I kind of took a couple minutes longer, but I can answer questions if anybody has any or any thoughts about the presentation. Well, that was a lot of information there. Thank you so much. I, wow, a lot of stuff to think about there. Yeah, um, uh, everybody, you guys are all unmuted, by the way, or you can unmute yourself. So please feel free to unmute and ask any questions you have. Yeah, I had a question about the FireWise. Um, from the way you presented it, it sounds like you get the FireWise after you've kind of started and saying you're going to be doing it. But I was kind of surprised that you don't actually have to do a certain amount of work and show that you've made progress on it. So I was wondering if I have misunderstood. Yeah, usually um, you have to fill out a survey that says, um, you, most people when they submit their first year application have about 50% neighborhood participation. They've done the RISTIC assessment, which you need to submit. They have to demonstrate that they've done the educational event. They have to have had a work party to do some work in the neighborhood. There's kind of a form that they give you that you fill in and you submit. And then you, to keep your accreditation, you continue to work on the project year after year and continue to get recertified. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think it does. Um, my other question is um, more towards the presentation. It looks like you've been recording this. Will this be available online afterwards? Yeah, I'm going to uh, upload this to YouTube and I'll make it available afterwards. Awesome. Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody? Any other questions? It's a very thorough presentation, so <laughs> I think there's a lot to digest in there. Yeah, um, and in, 
just one last comment. My husband and I have been working since uh, the fire in 2008, and every year we do a bit more. This is not something you can do in six months, but winter is coming on. It's a great time to think, plan, limb up, take care of some things, get going, and just uh, make a list of your priorities. Start close to your house and continue to work your way out. Go ahead, Allison or Terry. I, I was just going to ask if we were going to go back to that first photo. <laughs> oh, I can. The one the, of the house that burned? Yeah, and it was all clear all around it. Okay, yeah, that took me a minute to get back there. Ah. <laughs> we covered a lot of material. Yes. There we go. Okay, well, how did that, why did that yeah. happen? <laughs> uh, did our, that thought, happen? our thought is that it, it was the vegetation right up against the house uh, that right. caught the house on fire. That's right. the five foot zone around the house. I mean, they, you can see the lawn is still green, mm -hmm. but the embers got in, got, got going right up against the siding of the house, probably got up into the eaves of their gutters. Probably their gutters didn't have anything in them because there's not really a lot around that could have filled their gutters, but it was probably vegetation right up against the house that caused this house to burn. And what's all that black area outside the green, is that, where a fire came and like burned all the grass or was that always yeah. like that? Or? I think that's all burned. You can see it uh, burned across, the, you know, to the road too and across the road as well. Wow. Any other questions, anyone? Um, I was wondering, so for our particular area, um, there's a lot of redwoods. Um, and redwoods tend to want to grow in groupings. Um, you get those rings and uh, tight little growths. Um, is the implication of this that you want to not have any groupings and you want to like take out except for one tree in, in the area? Or how do we interpret that in terms of redwoods? You know, it's a good question, and I have a friend who's an arborist that I would like to ask that. The reason you see those rings is the old growth redwoods were cut in the 1860s through about 1900. And they, those are sprouts that came up from the original tree that was in the center. I, they're all connected, and I'm not really sure about the implications of selectively cutting in among them if that's advised or not. Um, you could surely limb them up, you know, 20, 30 feet, it wouldn't hurt the trees, but I don't really know about the rings. I'll, I'll see if I can find out. Um, Allison, um, if you, let's see, I, 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 I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how to get back to you, but I could find that out. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering because I know you're supposed to have spacing between trees, but with redwoods, they don't seem to grow that way, at least in our current ecology. Yeah, and I don't know the implications of selectively cutting in there. I, I can find out though. And um, we've, we've been raking about five feet to 10 feet out from each redwood and um, we're raking up as much duff as we can. So I think that that might help too, having a, a clear space, clearer space around the redwood groves. Terry, was your house okay in the fire? Yeah, yeah, it was fine. We had probably about a third, a quarter to a third of our property burn, but um, no smoke damage, really. Everything was... No, we were good. Good. Yeah. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Any other questions? 
I guess not. Well, listen, Luzanne, thank you so much for uh, doing this awesome presentation. I really appreciate it. And I will put it up on YouTube and give it to you and everyone who's come here today um, to replay anytime you want to. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Stay safe. <laughs>